everybody and welcome to the Damcasters and to our special mini-series on Boeing's fortresses. I'm delighted to have Ben Skipper returning to us, who has written three of Pen and Sword's flight craft series on the B-17, the B-29, and the Evergreen B-52. And we're going to look into each of those aircraft in depth over the next three weeks. And of course, if you want to see all of the aircraft, I think all of the aircraft that we mentioned over these three episodes, head out to the incredible Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, who continue to support the work we do here at the Damcasters, and we thank them and the team there so much. It is an incredible place. It is aeroplane mecca, and I cannot recommend heading out there especially when it's freezing cold here in England, because it literally is a magical place if you are an AV geek. So many thanks to Pima for continuing to sponsor the show. Check them out at www.pimaair.org. And of course, to our friends at 909 Apparel, who keep sending me lovely t-shirts. And in this case, it's their new premium ultra tee with shoulder flashes. So check them out at 909apparel.com as well. But we're not going to mess around because we have got so much to get through this week as we look into the story behind the B-17 Flying Fortress. So in each episode, we're going to look at the development and the spec around the aircraft, the service of the aircraft, and then the aircraft's legacy, or in the case of the B-52, what it's up to today. That's the format, because that follows how the flight craft series works. So our first question to Ben is going to be to describe the flight craft series and how it can help you as an aviation enthusiast and if you're a modeler. So Ben, tell us a little bit about the flight craft series for Pen and Sword and which your three books about the B-17, B-29 and B-52 uh, make a part of. So yeah, the, the flight craft series, are, um, it's an interesting way of introducing modelers. Uh, to a range of famous aircraft. So, you've you mentioned the, tri the the trio of fortresses. What what the books are essentially are a potted history, which we will come on to later, because actually these potted histories can be quite quite in depth um, if you know how to word it properly. Um, and the, the, they're aimed at everyone, modelers, enthusiasts, um, or just people with general avi you know interest in aviation. So you'll, we'll, we'll, I talk about the development of the aircraft, its use in service, who's used it. Uh, notable aircraft, notable examples, lots of illustrations throughout. There's always a minimum of 100, 150, uh, mainly colour and historically relevant. Um, and, the, you know, we for the modellers, towards the end, we pop in some details of where you can get kits, where you can get um, add-ons such as resin, white metal, 3D print. Uh, and then we have some showcase builds, normally three or four. Uh, and these are done by either, you know, predominantly master modelers, but show what is capable and what you can build from the available kits, which sometimes there's loads of. <laughs> if you're dealing with, with, with armor, you, you're falling over stuff. With aircraft, sometimes less so, um, especially the B-52. Um, but that's that's the, the basic premise of, of, of all of the flycraft and all of the craft series. So what we're looking at is this potted history, but with that focus to help and maybe offer your 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 modeler out there a little bit more information, maybe some different ideas for their next build. So that's really the idea of the series. It is. I mean, if if you take the B seventeen for example, um, what one of the builds is what I call a scale one to one, uh, <laughs> and this was the the Memphis Bell, the the, the big. Uh, refresh of the Memphis Bell at the National Air Force Museum. Uh, oh, Ohio? Yeah, Dayton. Yeah, Dayton. There you go. God, I remembered it. That's, that's absolutely shocking that I should forget that. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> what what the modeler gets to see there is a nut and bolt rebuild and uh, repaint of a very famous uh, and iconic aircraft. Well, it wasn't the first to complete the 28 missions, but they, they get to see certainly the most famous of the of the B uh, B17 Fs 
in the flesh and, and look at the care that's taken and some of the techniques that the the uh, the team there have used are recognizable to most of us who make models uh, and use a paint a paintbrush or an airbrush. Never get my and head around an airbrush when I was doing modeling. <laughs> They, they one day I'm going to really bore people on how to use an airbrush, but then I think no, because there's some really good people out there who know how to use the airbrush far less than I do. And I must admit, when I look at some people's work, you think, yeah, you're lying. That's not an airbrush. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 yeah, it was either go everywhere or just run. I could never get. Oh, that's, that's by the by. I, I haven't made a model in years. I, I, I moved from from planes onto Formula One cars for a long time, and that was that, that was. The end of my modeling days. <laughs> I just haven't had the chance. <laughs> it's just been so busy with work. I've got literally a stash of kits that I really want to, would like to build. I'll get around to it. It'll, it'll happen. Uh, and then I'll bore people on social media with, look what I made. I made this. And then they'll say, good God. <laughs> Is he all right? <laughs> Is everything okay at home? <laughs> So um, wait, wait, sorry, continue. I'm, no, 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 I no, 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 you're right. No, no. With my ineptitude with airbrushes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so in terms of modelling, um, it is quite interesting um, because, and as well with, with enthusiasts, and I'm, I, I think information about aviation, there's there's a, there's a great deal out there. And one of the things I did find when I was certainly writing, writing these three, three titles was information seemed to stop around 1988. You know, there was, there was a great range of, of history books focusing on various aircraft in the 70s and 80s with this golden period. Um, and they, they had lovely, wonderful line drawings, uh, some really evocative photographs. They often went brilliantly, you know, sharp, but they were working with the, the restrictions of the time in terms of printing and the techniques. And these, while they were very well written, beautifully written, beautifully presented, they're often in, there are inaccuracies which sort of then follow uh, later, you know, um, publications. Some of which literally were verbatim copied, copies of somebody else's work. You know, I'm not saying that that plagiarism was rife in, in the 90s and early noughties, but it appeared. And not only in you know in in aviation history, in, in most history books. Uh, art history a wash was awash with plagiarism for a period so these books are an opportunity to actually take um, advantage of the amount of information we have out there and look at what there is and it, it, the little av groups um, that are out there b17 lovers right down to the, the, the one guy who worked for boeing years ago or he, or somebody's found some documents of the family they've, they've scanned them all and uploaded them so new documents have come to light um, and, and this, for example, I, I was able to find stuff for the B-52 and the B-29 that hadn't previously been used. And I thought, well, why is that? And you do a little bit of work into it. You say, oh, it was uploaded in 2017 or, or whenever. Hmm. And the last major title on the B-52 was pretty much late 80s, early 90s. Um, so you're able to take advantage of that. And that brings that to the modeler. Um, hmm. And it also brings uh, new imagery. And again, with some of the contemporary photographs that we have nowadays, there's the, the issue of access isn't what it used to be. You know, you used to didn't you know you, you would stand back, you take your photograph of the aircraft, you'd be lucky to get near a wheel well. Now you can climb inside it, you can literally do a walkthrough from tail to, from, you know, tail to nose. Uh, and for the modeler, this is ideal. You know, the correct color schemes, the correct interiors. I mean, there'll always be you know, for example, the B17. Was it chromium yellow? Was it green? Was it silver? Well, you have to find out. <laughs> yeah. we, we, can, we can get into that whole debate of how each of the factories had slightly different tints of paint because they came from different places. Uh, all, all that good stuff. But we, we won't because... No, because we're grown up. Yes. <laughs> and I'm sure there are other podcasts available that will go into what was coming out of Kansas City versus what was in, in LA and things like that. Yeah, yeah. it's... You know, yeah, exactly. And, and you, you make the very good point with, with the B-17. You had Boeing, you had Douglas, you had Vega. And mm. they're all, they all producing an aircraft which was constantly evolving uh, as they were coming off the, the production line. So there's always going to be a slight variation um, and slight idiosyncrasies, especially, you know, yeah. B-29 was a great one for that. Yeah. 
Oh, we'll, we'll come on to that. We'll come on to that one. Yes, because, yes. yeah, of course, as we all know, they were all in black and white. So who, who cares about the colours? Um, <laughs> no pink inside, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Baby pink looked fantastic. <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to do little potted histories on each of Boeing's fortresses. So this week, we're going to look at the B-17. Next week, we're going to look at the B-29. And then... However long it takes, we're going to look at the B-52 because that plane is going to outlast all of us. I'm, I'm pretty yeah. sure. My grandkids will be talking. They'll be doing whatever a future podcast is on you know, the 150-year-old airplane, which is a <laughs> remarkable story in, in and of itself. But we'll get, we'll get to that, dear listener. And, of course, join us on Patreon and you'll get it all early. But let's get cracking because I think it's fair to say that the B-17 is maybe after the civil stuff, the most famous aircraft Boeing has ever produced. Would Is that a fair assumption to say? Say after 747, 737, yeah. If people, if you're going to say name some Boeing airplanes, especially after the TV series and, and the movies, would we, is that fair or am I being? No, no, bit... I, I know. I think, I think you're being entirely fair because, if we, if we look at it in terms of location, we're, we're in the United Kingdom at the moment. And we had, you know, the B-17 was synonymous with Southeast England, you know, from mm -hmm. Norfolk through to Suffolk through to parts of Lincolnshire. The, the, the B-17 B was everywhere. And it had some great media exposure as well yep. of the time being, you know, contemporary. And, and the main the main reason being it, it was a day day aircraft it was operated during the day which was um pioneered by the raf people tend to forget that you know we we, we received the first of the b-17s uh we received the b-17c what we didn't do we didn't listen to boeing the raf didn't listen to boeing so i'm sorry if that's going to upset people but they didn't the b-17 from its very inception when, when everyone looked at how the america's future heavy bomber was going to operate it was going to be fast. It was going to carry a big bomb load. And most importantly of all, it was going to be able to defend itself. To do that, it had to do it by mass. Um, we'll, we'll talk about, move on to that later. And by mass, I mean squadron effort, not a flight. What the RAF did was very RAF, actually. Oh, you do it that way. Well, bug you. We're going to do it this way. And rather than deploy... You know, Just for the listener to know... You are an ex-RAF man, so I am. Yes. So if anyone starts having a go, poor on Matt. <laughs> no. Okay. I was in the RAF. I know exactly what the RAF culture is like, and I don't care. You know, lived experience. I mean, in fairness, I was in the RAF when it was more like Club eighteen thirty with fast jet. <laughs> <laughs> so there was that massive disclaimer. Um, but but the RAF, they they felt that they could tweak a little. And bearing in mind, this was, you know, this wasn't their first heavy bomber by any stretch of the imagination. They, they you know, had, they had the Halifax, um, but this was their first, perhaps heavily armed bomber. And they felt that a flight of three aircraft could feasibly defend one another. Um, to give them their dues, they, they tried their best and they didn't lose too many aircraft. 90 Squadron did reasonably well. But while they're operating this aircraft, they're sending details, they're sending data back to Boeing, and most importantly of all, they're sending it back to the United States Army Air Corps, USAC, who are looking at this and they're thinking, oh, they should be having more successes, and why aren't they? Well, how many aircraft are they sending out? Oh, three. Uh, there, was, there was a famous raid on the Geisenau. Um, three B-17Cs were sent over as a, you know, as a distraction. Of course, the Germans didn't fall for it because they the radar picked up all the Hamptons and, and the uh, the Wellingtons that were coming from the, the main site and they got absolutely decimated. Well, and I'd use that term not correctly, but they, they, they got a good shoeing from German the fighters. Fe Fe February 42 raids on Brest. Right? Yeah, the February yeah. 42, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and it was, it, it, you know, it was it was almost like the, the famous ferry attacks on the bridges mm. over the Mers. It, it was that sort of disaster. But that highlighted the we weren't using the B-17 correctly. It should have been the B-17s in mass making the raid. Not, uh, and the the, the, the Wimpies and, and the Hamptons doing the diversionary tactics. We got it wrong. But what was interesting, it highlighted though, randomly, that the RAS used that actually the B-17 
wasn't actually a very bad aircraft. It was just used incorrectly. This gave certainly strength to USAC's doctrine of strength in mass. You know, we have to deploy these things en masse. And that in turn helped the wider American idea of producing some 500 bombers a year. That's what they wanted to produce. And what the RAF had done for the Americans in particular was saying, well, the Americans said, we need more of these. We can't rely on just 90. We need 900. We need 9,000. This, of course, then left, led to FDR's demand that the Americans should be producing 50,000 aircraft a year, which they very nearly did at the height of production. I think it was 47,000 they, they reached at yeah. one point. So it, 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 it helped, the, it certainly helped the Americans hone in on how to develop their bomber force. For Boeing, it highlighted that the, that the back of the aircraft was vulnerable. So from the D, we had the introduction of the rear gunner, sorry, the E, sorry, uh, the introduction of the gunner. If I've got that wrong, I do apologise. I've got three aircraft going on to be headed. <laughs> I, I have, I, I happen to have the page that you're discussing in, in, in your, your book. And yes, you are quite right. It was from the E that got the turn yeah. at the back. So, so the, so straight away, Boeing are using lessons learned. Now, this would come in really handy for the subsequent uh, fortress, member of the fortress family. The other thing that the RAF's use really highlighted was the Norden, the famous Norden bombsite. Hit a barrel from 70,000 feet or whatever it was. Now, what was interesting was the, the RAF weren't using it correctly. Did, did anybody use it correctly? They're, they're, they're in, did. They're in <laughs> No, no, it was it was an exceptionally complex piece of machinery. It was very advanced for its time, and I think putting it in something like the B seventeen, that was that was a risk that they they were happy to take because it, it, it's the old carrot myth, isn't it? This thing will hit anything, so we can put in a, we can we can transform an aircraft's lethality by having a site that will drop a bomb into a barrel. An excellent amount of feet, a bit like you know, off pilots eat carrots at night, so we're better pilots. Mm. Um, and, and it served that purpose. You, you said, I, was... I look up, I've got a painting of sign painting of John Cunningham, and a, a... <laughs> <laughs> that was that was always the the the, the myth, wasn't it? it was like, you know, he, yeah, he had, he had a whole bushel of carrots, carrots. every day to make sure to... <laughs> the fact he had radar didn't really <laughs> no, and and, he, and again, this is you know, that's quite an interesting comment to make because it was radar that would would really shape how the eighth especially when they came to england in the in early 1942 operated uh the b-17 now at this point boeing uh and claire they now i'm going to try i've written the name down and i sincerely hope i get this right edvelt who was the lead uh, on the whole b-17 program were key to encapsulate all of the doctrine work that have been carried out by numerous people, right from right from the get go of Billy Mitchell, right through to developing the the, the whole concept of bombing uh, in America, which was re really was a poor cousin to pursuit, um, and creating something that was both new, dynamic, and useful. You know, the the Americans up until really uh, 1935 were absolutely adamant that their bombers would be two engine. You know, mm -hmm. as personified by the B-18, Douglas B-18. Uh, in interesting looking aircraft, rarely spoken about. Um, but that's where the Americans felt that Bobby would be. And also they were having to deal with the, the isolationist uh, aspect of defence policy, which gave birth to a much larger aircraft later on, the B-36, which I'm sure we'll talk about at some point in the very near future, if at all. So the B-17 flew in, in the face of everything political that the Americans had conceived, considered the, the bomber to be. So when it came to America, they were, sorry, to the United Kingdom, I think, you know, in early 1942, the Americans were really cutting their teeth on a doctrine which they'd written about, and they'd practiced in friendly skies, uh, but not the numbers that they were going to employ over the next three years. Um, and they were using feedback data uh, and lessons learned from an air force that had perhaps used the, the B-17 to its fullest potential 
meanwhile they were having to they were facing off against certainly when flying over northern europe a defensive force that now had radar had excellent command and control of its fighter network and were keen to defend its cities because the RAF had shown them up in 1940 when we bombed Berlin. Mm -hmm. So you've got all that going on and you've got an aircraft that's still in development. <laughs> um, and, but it's in development. Yeah, let, let's, I just wanted to pick up on that point because that yeah. is something that we, we have this idea that, you know, the, the B-17 F isn't it that 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 arrives with with the um with the eighth in, in early forty two, the, the sort of classic one, the Memphis Bell one. That's the one everybody sort of remembers. It's still a work in progress because, like you're saying, the political environment that it it was in was changing and refining its design, which is why they were already A B C D E on their sixth variant of it. Yeah. Sorry, having to, <laughs> sorry, do, I should know that off the top of my head. I had to use my fingers, dear listener. But yeah, this this is. This is not a fully formed thing, and that will play out as it's as it's being thrown into a live fire situation. Yeah, absolutely, and the, and the other thing is that the B seventeen had had its baptism of fire um, with the USAC on the seventh of December, albeit you know it was caught up. There were the C's and D's caught up on a transit flight in the midst of the attack on Hawaii, Pearl Harbor. And thereafter, the Americans were then fighting a defensive war with an offensive weapon. You know, they, they fought through Java, they retreated back to Java, they retreated back from the Philippines. And one of the things that they recognized from, from these experiences, plus well, the experiences of the Royal Air Force, were they had actually got a very good aircraft. You know, the B-17, it, it's, like, um, it's like a toddler. Toddlers will bounce. <laughs> <laughs> That's just barren. Oh, oh yeah, toddlers, they're, they're pretty they're pretty robust. But this we were now wanting to go from stumbling toddler to an athlete to, to the athlete, to the young young athlete. And so the Americans are starting to realise that okay, we've got a good aircraft, but we really need to refine it. And lessons learned, especially in the Pacific led to the F, for example, having two forward firing ports for 0 .303 uh, guns because the Japanese weren't hitting them with aircraft that were perhaps always armed with cannon, but they were always coming face up. Mm. So that was that was a problem. Then, of course, you know, they were still they were flying aircraft that had a mix of, uh, of uh, tail guns and non tail guns. That design needed to be refined and that would be refined with the introduction of the Cheyenne sort of ball like rear gun mount that was seen on the G. But while they're fighting on the back foot and these guys are flying two or three days at a time, these guys are literally hanging out of their, their suits. They've got the crew chiefs in the aircraft who are doing running repairs at dirt at airfields. You've got the guys of the 8th, not living in luxury, but create they're, they're developing a new offensive model and they're bombarded with information. They're bombarded with an ever-changing and ever-evolving situation. And so by the time the F is in theatre, and this is the first B-17 that is produced in any numbers, I think about 3,000 were produced, um, they're able to start taking the war to the enemy, which is, you know, the, the first raid was led by a guy, you may have heard his name, Tibbetts, Paul Tibbetts. Hmm. He, he, he'll <laughs> crop up in episode two, I think. Yeah, so this, 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 is, this young gun... <laughs> He led the first raid in April, uh, mid-April. Of... Well, dear listener, that's why Tibbetts was chosen for that mission. We'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. <laughs> yeah. he, he led the first B-17 raid against Germany. I mean, what a morale booster. On one hand, you've got the Air Forces, uh, the 9th and the 6th. Six who are kicking their heels, frankly, around, around Panama. 9th have had an absolute beasting at the hands of the Imperial Japanese Navy, the Imperial you know, Japanese Army aviation branches. Um, but they've proven that the, the platform is, is wise. You've got the 15th and the 12th literally getting ready to scratch a living in an existence in North Africa and the Mediterranean. But the guys in, in the in the eighth are actually the guys who are really doing the development work now. They're looking at developing this aircraft as an offensive platform, and most importantly, as a day weapon. 
So, you know, when you see these 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 cinematic reproductions of the raids, I think sometimes they're toned down hmm. because they're they're absolute murder by 1943. Um, certainly, with the introduction of the you know, Fokker Wolves 190, they're up against some really good pilots that, who had excellent aircraft. Now, thankfully, you know, they were they were operating at the very edge of fighter cover. This is the the Eighth Army, which gave wise rise to a very odd variant, the YB-40 or XB-40, depending on how you want to talk, you know, refer to it, which was a B-17 guns to the gills. It had 13.5 uh, <laughs> guns, but it was so slow. What would normally take it 25 minutes to get to 30, 20,000 feet, took this almost 50. <laughs> <laughs> Can't work that one out. It really shows you how much ammo this thing was carrying. But it was literally... A, a last resort because they were losing aircraft in numbers and, and they were getting pulled apart. From these early experiences, back to Boeing, came the G. So the G was just over 8,000 when it went in serial production. Some Fs, some of the, the last Fs, I think the last 100 Fs, were produced in G configuration. Um, and the uh, armoured side, the the F had the new, the E and the F had the new clearer uh, nose. A lot of the glazing had gone and plexiglass was pretty much single piece with, with your flat optic piece for the, for the bomb aimer. But the G also had the two sided guns that were in little bow, bow like windows, quite quite cute little, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and it had an ashtray. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for the, for the navigator who's now moved, and well, they, you know, the, the, the Americans were now getting confident that they were producing something that would pack an absolute wallop, and it did. You know, when when the Germans started their their forward attacks, all of a sudden they were getting belted by two, you know, twin point five O's. It came as an absolute shocker to them. So they went round the back, the new Cheyenne turret, which is called the Cheyenne turret purely because of where it was made. And, Nothing exciting. I'm afraid about that. <laughs> um, was doing the same, but the Americans were getting better with their discipline and their their, their fire. Have you ever seen the the German Arc model they did of the B-17? Yeah, yeah, that, that was I'll, modeled. I'll on... dig up a picture and try to stick it up in here. Yeah. yeah, I think that's in the book, but that was modeled on uh, the the F. So it misses out a few things. I think they might I believe if I'm wrong, apologies. Just as much as the Germans knew about the capabilities, defense capabilities of the the B-17, the Americans were getting to be aware of its offensive capabilities, and they were now using it um, to its maximum. You know, it's it was limited in a great many ways. Its design meant that the bomb bay couldn't be enlarged. So, if you were to compare it to the Avro Lancaster. Which yeah, he, he, this is this is the standard top trump comparison, isn't it? It's the min, minimal bomb load. A mosquito could carry the same the same amount and and all that jazz. Exactly, you know. Um, but the Americans could do it on mass. So what they couldn't make up with with individual aircraft, they just, you know, when we did a thousand bomber raid, it was like, oh yeah, we've done this. The Americans are probably thinking, yeah, pretty pretty close, quite a few times, guys. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know the situations are entirely different. But it was the sheer mass of aircraft that the Americans were sending. And it wasn't just one or two waves. Sometimes it was up to, I think, I think the most they did was five waves. Mm. I think. I could be wrong. But they were, they were using the B-17 literally as a hammer now. Um, and then when you had the F-30, F the, the, the P-51, P-47s, the lightnings appear in, in, your, in England, they were literally uncontested masters now. Um, plus, with the advance of, of Allied forces into Italy, because we're in Europe now, people forget that. People seem to think that somehow Italy is, is external to the European war. Oh, no. We've been in there since 1943. We've got aircraft flying from well, Catch-22. You know, we, we're, we're taking the war um, to Central Europe from the south. Yeah. All you, of a You've sudden. got those massive airfields at Foggia, and then you've got yeah. Corsica, which is essentially an aircraft carrier. Yeah, yeah, aircraft carrier with a with a nice cream, nice know, beach, donut yeah. shop on the side, you know, a nice beach on the side. Um, <laughs> perhaps you know. So at this point, the B seventeen is master of its domain. I mean, uh, uh, you know, but in terms of the Pacific, 
its limitations had, had basically made it just it's not part of the conversation mm -hmm. its range was limited uh, its bomb load was limited you know what 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 what's the what do you get rid of you know if you want to increase range you have to decrease the bomb load if you want to use the bomb load you have to operate within a quite a close area to to the front lines and the size of the theater precluded the b17 pretty much from operations for about mid 1942. plus we have the b24 uh, which was making that neck of the woods its own stomping ground and it was performing very well um hence this adoption uh, in the mediterranean in the MENA theater uh, mediterranean uh, in middle east uh, north africa so by 1944 pre pre-d-day um yeah the b-17 was very much the kid on the block and all of the design work had created a very 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 good day bomber mm -hmm. and it was it was interesting because it was literally designed as they went along and, and developed now um, just as we get onto that yeah, as we're developing, as we're going along, let let's talk because we mentioned before we started the ball turret thing. Yes, <laughs> we we need we need to do do this bit. So there's many many stories about the B seventeen and the ball turret. Would you like to just tell our dear listener about the Spiri ball turret myth and how it's just that it's just a myth. So, so the spirit bolter is a weird one. So I'm gonna to have to go back to my book. <laughs> <laughs> Where are we? Um, yeah, I, I, when I was re researching the, the, the whole aircraft, the spirit bolter made it made its appearance. Uh, let's have a look. I think it was the D. No, yep. was, yeah, yeah. So, so, so this thing was. Uh, I'm just gonna scroll. I'm really sorry about this, guys. Should this should be. Bah, bah, bah. Um, I've, I'm dear listener as well. We're recording all three of these episodes at the same time. So poor old Ben, I've thrown him in saying, yeah, "Would you do it in one go? You, you can, you can tell us about, you know." I mean, um, I could tell you all about a hundred, a hundred, <laughs> almost a hundred years of Boeing development in uh, in one go. Sorry, yeah, right. So, no, no, so, so the Sperry is it's an interesting one. Was it Sperry? Was it Bendix? Okay, well, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, that's an interesting one. Um, they were both. There were there were two turrets initially. There was a Sperry which was remotely operated, um, and it wasn't a great success. A similar sort of turret was used on the Lancaster, trialed on the Lancaster for a short period of time. The Ball turret, I think Bendix, I believe. Oh God, I can't, I can't remember. They wrote these books not long ago. Um, I think it is Bendix. It, 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 sorry, Bendix was a chin turret. Yeah, yeah, the Bendix was a chin, so no, it was a yeah. Sperry. Yeah, but the, yeah. the so so the Sperry turret. So the, there's a lot of you know they 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 climbed in at the beginning of the the mission and they'd fly off. Yeah, no, that didn't happen. No. I'm sorry, gang, that is pure th <laughs> pure theatre. If you can imagine crouching, uh, not at my age, but if you imagine crouching, it was always quite uncomfortable. And I'm actually doing that for 12 hours in up to minus 50 air temperatures, isolated from the rest of the crew, and you haven't got a parachute or access to possibly escape. No, it wasn't wise. Uh, and it was actually um, almost against policy and procedure what it was uh, to do that. So what would happen was the, 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 the when they took off, the guns would be level, facing to the rear, so they will so no muck would be ingested into the barrels. You know, it didn't retract fully uh, like that on the B-24. Once, uh, and the gunner would be with the rest of the crew. And he'd sit up there for the first couple of hours, chillaxing. The moment they were, they, they, they sort of made entry over the area where they were likely to encounter uh, opposition, just prior to that, the, the auto would be rotated. And it, the hatch came up and he'd climb in. Now, there's a reason why he was small, apart from the fact that the ball turret was very small, but he was on a gimbal. Mm -hmm. So the, heads, the poor, poor, poor individual had to sort of get between the, the, the arms of the gimbal and squeeze into this thing. Ditch his parachute, get in, and, and they'd rotate it. And so he, was, he, he, would, he would then take control and he could make the moves. 
that he needed to do. Now, the reason for the Sperry was that the Sperry was a very good piece of kit. It could be hand cranked round, so you know, I, th- I think it's one of the one of the films. It might have been even uh, Memphis spell where they had to do a belly landing, uh, and they couldn't get the guy out. A lot of that is drama. They could hand crank it. So if the mechanism or the hydraulics were shot, not for Memphis you... Bell. That's fantastic story. The Steven Spielberg one with um, Kevin Costner. That's the one. Yeah. Yes, which yeah. does have. Sorry, dear listener, no. the biggest B seventeen in the world. That set is massive. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but it's, it's yeah, it's um, um, uh, yeah, Costner's the captain. Um, uh, who was it? Who uh, was Kiefer, it? Kiefer Sutherland's the, the radio. It's got a fan, um, fantastic stories. Is it fantastic stories? I think it is, yeah. yeah. And he he draws the wheels. Oh, wonderful, so, <laughs> wonderful, story. yeah. Sorry, <laughs> no, no, not. I'm trying to remember this. Is so many films. So, the so the gunner is in place, um. He's got a, He's got oxygen. He's got electricity for his heated suit. He's got a first aid kit. It's a very small target as well. People tend to forget that. So if if, if he's hit, it's really unfortunate. Now, there were occasions where the gunner was hit, and if they were, sadly, it, was, it tended to be fatal, um, because the thing that was hitting was firing with a cannon. The other reason is, if you know, they they could hand crank it round, but often they, if there was no crew at the back. Uh, and you had wounded guys at the front, and chances are he's going to be wounded if his controls are out. It was very much a commander's decision to make whether or not to try and crank it round. And sometimes the gears would be would be shot away as well. So this poor individual, and it is a horrific way to go, but he was, you know, thankfully very quick because the weight of the aircraft literally mm. fell on, onto the, uh, the, 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 the turret. All of that aside, after the mission was over, once they were back in reasonably friendly size skies, the guy was hauled out. I mean, he only had 250 rounds anyway, which was a great deal. So if you can imagine over the target area, he's squeezed in there. He'll have expended those rounds reasonably quickly, probably within five, ten minutes in the target-rich environment. I did find something somewhere, and it's, it was one of the gunners, one of the race gunners. I think, no, it was the upper gunner. We'll talk about them in a minute. Would come down either crank him round or bang on the um, the turret and say, right, come out. And they would pull him out and he would then relieve one of the other gunners if they oh, were okay. yeah. injured. Yeah. I found it like, it's one of the, it's, it's like the Boy Scout thing when I found that. You know, the Boy Scout <laughs> by the B-17. I've not been able to find it since and it's driven me potty. But there was there was a lot of that going on. But yeah, that they would be pulled out. Um, it could be jettisoned uh, if they needed to. They were, and I think they they did try and experiment more locally than actually organisationally by Boeing to try and work out a way of being able to bring it up, Mm. Um, drop the guns out, bring it up, and get the guy in. But I think the complexity of it uh, and the time needed just again the the expediencies of war outweighed the practicalities. And there's there's not a lot. I'll I'll put a link in here for our our tour of the the three ninetieths B seventeen G where they've got that in, you can see there is not a lot of height, unlike on the, the B-24, which is sort of thin and thin and tall. Um, if they were going to ratchet that up, there's only three or four, not even that, much clearance above the gimbal. It's a small, small bit of room in there. Yeah, and again, going back to your remarks about the world's biggest B-17, they were very small. You know, up mm. until the F, the, 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 the side gunners were back to back. Yeah, This caused real problems with the F once they... they you know they they were they were in doing regular heavy saturation raids, banging into each other, throwing each other a fame. That must have led to one or two crosswords, mm-hmm. and and so by the time the G they've Boeing have staggered the windows, which gives the gunners a lot more room. Um, but as which you always saying, to me seems one of those requirement things. As speaking as somebody who writes requirements, that you would look at it and go, that doesn't seem right, but a way it is. Yeah, it lasted um, for a long time. Anyways, I interrupt. Continue. No, no, not at all. And and, and that was, was, you know, that was again an expedient and shows the development through combat of uh, you know the the B the B seventeen. But the introduction of you have the introduction of the power turret at the bottom. You have the introduction of the power turret at the top. And that itself created later problems. Um, I don't know if I, I think I tried to put it in the book. I probably didn't because I've run out of word count. <laughs> 
But what they were discovering, especially with aircraft that had done quite a few missions, they were suddenly blowing up. It was suddenly exploding midair. Uh, and, and they couldn't understand why. And the upper turret, the, as it rotated, it was brushing against one of the oxygen lines. Oh, yeah. So it was causing hairline cracks. And so this was feeding mm. in, into, the, into the aircraft. So the moment the gunner, mm. they turn you know, big, big pressure, but big pressure over the exploded. Um, sadly, that, they discovered that pretty close to the end of the war. But, you know, I suppose that it, that's a reflection of how rapidly things were changing in the aircraft was developing because probably people looked at it and thought, yeah, it might be a problem, but is the aircraft going to survive that long? It's a B-17. You can yeah. literally take half of it off and it'll still get home. Um, and is it really likely to be happening? You know, is that like, it is, an, you know, around detonating in the chamber of a, of a cannon going to set off oxygen? Uh, 20 odd thousand feet in a minus 50 zone i mean that was a rare occurrence but it did happen i i have to admit that was one of the bits i felt they did quite well in masters of the air is they did show an oxygen fire when the oxygen bottles got hit because that that, oof, that would be terrible because there's oxygen bottles all over the place on those things because they, they they have to have them and they're yeah. essentially little bombs sitting there and um waiting to go off and they're, they're not armored or anything and yeah oh that horrible horrible yeah and, and again it was that expedient because it wasn't pressurized i mean there were they were that they looked to pressurize the b17 but they simply couldn't do it yeah. too many too many leaks it, it was <laughs> it, you know unlike what came after it just wasn't designed for that sort of flight you know i know they had the model th you know the, the the big strato liner which was pressurized that had been developed around the same time completely different fuselage and so the b17 really um quite possibly was one of the more uncomfortable aircraft to be flying in during the second world war as well cold and drafty yeah no you know and, and, and they, they 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 did mitigating uh design tweaks probably especially with with the side side guns um mm -hmm. they changed from the pullback tilt back uh blisters that we would see later on the catalina for that style of thing or they would rotate up and over um to, to the sort of rectangular apertures in the side. Um, initially, they were a whole piece. Of plexiglass glass was pulled out. The gun was pulled in. Uh, and for the G, they had two pieces of either side of the aperture with a single uh, gap for the gun to fire through, which seemed to work. Um, and, it, and it worked well enough for, for them to carry on throughout the production of the G and, and not really change it. So, like you said, it, it's been developed all the way through and my favorite bit in all three of your books is the the random variance bit towards the end where, where you get to get to the weird the weird and wonderful stuff um we will save the addition of h2x and things like that for a specific conversation so that we can we can discuss <laughs> the day the eighth air force bomb prog by accident when they flew past <laughs> a city that was literally on fire in Dresden and went on for another 150 miles and bombed a city that wasn't on fire. So all because the guy in the lead plane didn't know how to work is. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> following the wrong river. Let's just leave it at that, shall we? But I have, I've got it here as, as we're chatting. Yeah. There was so many experimental elements that they tried on the B-17. I guess this is the thing. You've got a lot of them, so you can try yeah. stuff on one or two of them going through. What were some of your standouts in it? Because you've got the the Vega built ones that they did try lots of different things on. So that's the ones that are built by Lockheed. Was there any ones that sort of jumped out at you that were fun I, to write about? I, I What would be really good fun? I, I think with, with the Vega lock, you know, the Lockheed have always been innovators, as, as we know. So they, they were given an aircraft to play with. It's a little bit like giving a, you know, letting loose five five year olds in a sweet shop. Help yourself, and they did. And, and I think they were really close to the Allison inline engine variant. Mm -hmm. I think you know, I'm just going. I'm going to bring it up so I get the right because I've because I, I found this really really interesting. Well, there's another one I find quite interesting, but yeah. So so the so the Vega. Um, it was the, the they called it the XB38, 
Uh, let me just find the engine model because it's it's an inline. Here we go. So it's the 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 Olison V seventeen ten ninety eight V twelve inline uh, fourteen twenty five engine. That's pretty powerful when you consider that the original engines on the B uh, the B twenty nine uh, were nine hundred horsepower. The the issue that they had Vega had was that they had to introduce water cooling, uh, redesign the wing to accommodate the enclosed nacelle for the inline engine. Um, you know, fuel injection and stuff like that. The, it, it was a completely different ball game. The idea, I think, was actually very sound. And had they really gone with it, that would have given us, I don't think a B40, I think that was going a little bit too far, but definitely a B17H uh, would have been interesting to see. I know there was a B17H later uh, in, in the ASE rescue role, but it would have been quite interesting. And I think that would have been, that would have allowed uh, the B-17 possibly see a little bit more action in the Far East, operating from India, possibly, um, or even from Burma in numbers. It, it, it was a, quite a clever idea. I mean, the other one was the, uh, make sure it's a CQ, CG, let's have a look, the CG-17. It had, actually had three different uh, codes. So you had the C-108, CB, VB, uh, 17G transporters. These were remarkable. So you had a, a VVIP version, which was Don, um, MacArthur's personal taxi. So it's getting, getting some action in the in the Far East. And they, they did a, a combat troop version, which carried 65 folk. <laughs> what were they doing? Were they sitting on each other's laps? I mean, the B-17, again, Kevin Costner aside, and he's a fine actor, don't get me wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but it's... If you go and look at a B-17, go go uh, to Hendon, have mm -hmm. a look at it. It's small. These aircraft, uh, we we have this miss. You know, we we have this miss sort of how how big is it? We we don't fully appreciate the size of these things. I mean, if you look at the B-24, it's only six inches longer than an F-15. Yep. You know, um, so the B-17 was wasn't a huge aircraft, and it wasn't very tall. A lot, you know, you see them coming out stooped. We went until you see a Lancaster. They used to crawl around in those things. And somehow they got 65 people in that. It... <laughs> it's like sardines, isn't it? Right. We can do this. What, yeah. What's the spec? We'll get as many guys in as we can. Yeah. I, I, I know people were slightly smaller in those days. But I don't think they were, they were, they were, they were paper thin. <laughs> There's not a lot of room in them with 10 guys. There wasn't a lot of room with four, three or four of us climbing around in it back in February. And granted, we were gentlemen of a stature. Um, Joe Welding aside, who's yeah. like this, is a lot thinner than us. Um, and then, of course, you had, and, I, and I've already mentioned it, the, the H, which was the SE rescue version. Uh, and that was remarkable because it carried this really good boat, uh, self-writing boat, and I get the name so I, so I don't look an absolute biff. And this thing would be dropped. Um, Higgins L1. Higgins, that's the Higgins. Yeah, the, the, the Higgins boats, the guy, you know, who gave us landing craft. And they were using this in Korea. Uh, and that's quite, that's, that's quite interesting because you, you see an aircraft which they stopped producing in April 1945 is once again back at war. Mm. Um, and, and, and in fairness, you know, by the, by the early 1950s, you would have thought the B-17 would have been smelted, sold to Boy Scouts, used as a gate guard or given to museums, but they were still in active service. You had it fulfilling uh, reconnaissance roles. You know, there was a, a B-17 that flew 19 hours over China, manned entirely by a Chinese crew, getting in, intel on what was going on in, in China. You had the, the the drones that were used for everything to monitor fallout from special weapon detonations through to, I think, one of the last missions that a B-17 drone did was to prove the AIM-9 missile in 1959. And you also had B-17s used drones as fighter practice. But, I mean, that soon tailed off because why are we, why are we sort of shooting a propellered aircraft with jet aircraft? Well, OK, TU-4 aside, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a really good point. And again, that then leads to the TU-4, which is, yeah, that's an interesting one, isn't it? Yes, but that's <laughs> that's that's next week's episode, dear listener. Isn't it? 
tea you're it is. the pool, isn't it? Yeah, it was, we'll, yeah, we'll, the we'll pool. Yeah, there's, nice there's, there's a there's a there's a teaser. There's a you. teaser. There's a teaser. <laughs> um, but but, but it, this I, okay. This is this is the thing. So we we've we've got interestingly with all three of these aircraft seeing multi-war service, and in the case of the B fifty two, which we'll get onto much later, many 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 conflicts going through. Is that something about the underlying design of these aircraft that they have a level of longevity? So we're yeah, we're talking into the fifties here. So from the first one to the last year, twenty odd years for the the B seventeen, which is which isn't bad going really, considering it's from the first model through to the let's say the H with the the boat on the bottom, essentially still the same thing. It is. It, it Boeing. You know, um, and we we had this chat before we started. The Boeing people forget that Boeing in 1933, it was re reeling from having its wings proverbially clipped. You know, it was this huge organisation. It was doing civil aviation. It was doing military aviation. It was doing holidays. It was doing pleasure flights. It was do doing all sorts. And then all of a sudden, you know, the American government went, "You've got a bit of a monopoly, the monopoly going there, lads." Clip, clip, move around. So by the time, uh, you know. Um, the opportunity came up for the XB-15, which was the precursor to the, the XB-17. Boeing were really down on their luck. They were laying people off. Seattle were really panicking about whether or not they would be able to build this aircraft. And I think that gave impetus to creating, to, to the genesis of a range of aircraft that were not only rugged, and all three were, and are, exceptionally rugged but also had a design that could be easily worked with can be easily adapted um, and in the case of the b-17 you know you, you saw when we've touched on this there was a civilianization of the b-17s uh, especially post war you know we had fire bombers mm -hmm. and the, the term fire bomber has its roots in the b-17 here's a bomber here's a fire i'm going to put out the fire with my bomber fire bomber oh that's a lovely little story what a lovely way to end a career whereas you had the precursor to scandinavian air services um doing a deal with the americans to well send you back you know guys who'd 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 landed in sweden after being severely damaged or had a lot of wounded crew landed in sweden the swedes would repatriate them back to the united kingdom and in return the americans would send them bits to convert the b-17s into what were affectionately known as felixes little something in aircraft because it's because <laughs> the scandinavians most of they'd lost a few dc-3s to uh the luftwaffe on their uh, stockholm to well definitely sweden to, to scotland route so they wanted something that was fly higher fly faster um and be more robust so they got <laughs> they did a deal we'll give you your lads back you give us the kit to make a really good air you know uh, airliner and then it shelves the, that adaptability as well as the, the the basic foundation of the design was sound you you you, you had something that nobody else really could do you know yeah. how, how many how many Bavro lancasters were converted into passenger planes handful about 13 and they weren't particularly successful but yet somehow the b-17 was remarkable it could do any it could do mail runs you know mm -hmm. it it formed the basis of a lot of small operators operating uh, civil aircraft in the early 1950s. Um, so Boeing kept, somehow kept that DNA of flexibility right into the, the B-29, which gave, which when we talk about that, people will go, they did what? Mm. Through to what could very possibly be the first century military aircraft with the B-52. So there is something about Boeing's approach to design that make the, that allows it to build aircraft that are so rugged. Um, it could be almost an Achilles heel to Boeing. Mm. Um, you design your aircraft too well. You know, you design aircraft that can take an absolute kicking, be patched up in sometimes absolutely appalling conditions and be back on the fly line within 24 hours. They couldn't really do that with the B-24. No. Um, you know, that was so, yeah, they created a legacy all because they needed to get it so right the first time around. You know, with, with those original orders when America decided, yeah, we're going to go down the route of the heavy bomber.
It's not what we want to do, but we're going to have to do it because we're being ushered that way by external pressures uh, occurring in China and in Central Europe. So let, let's wrap up on the B-17. From, yeah. from your standpoint, what's the legacy of the aircraft? It's, I think, as we said before, likely the most famous, of course, we've just had Masters of the Air as well, which has brought it all back. We've had Memphis Bell um, restored to all her glory, which created a lot of a lot of news. We've had the, uh, the William Wyler film remastered with um, colours and things. <laughs> We can we can discuss it as well. What in your mind is the legacy of this aircraft? And, and, and this is not to act lyrical, but as, as I see it, this aircraft defined a generation of airmen. Okay, you know, a, it, it did. It gave us the image of young men who played hard and worked exceptionally hard. You know, we, we were taking because the the, the American attitude was completely different to the British attitude. You know, we, the RAF, maintained this very straight-laced professionalism, which had been on its, you know, as part of its founding. If you look right back to how the RAF was founded, you joined the RAF as an officer, and you were trained as a pilot. Mm. So it was already there, you know. So when we went to war, we went to war as a professional uh, body, an independent air force that had professional pilots, be regular reserves. The Americans, they were taking teachers they were taking farmhands uh, they were taking textile workers and transforming them very rapidly and we did the same this isn't to be to, to detract from the RAF's efforts especially in Canada uh, and Oklahoma and Texas but they were literally grabbing these young men and putting them in an aircraft that was something else and I think having that trusting young men probably spurred the British on to giving young men the opportunity to fly are heavy, are heavy bombers because up to that point you had normally quite experienced pilots flying the big aircraft. So you know the Americans were willing to take a big risk using young folk, uh, and and it's that. So therefore, going back to your question, the legacy is one of trust, but it's also that the, the the fact that a lot of these young men who sometimes get absolute physical kicking and an emotional kicking would still get it back into the aircraft because they trusted it. And, and I think that's quite, that's some legacy because it wasn't just the fact that this thing took the war to, to the Germans because it, it didn't do that in isolation. Don't get me wrong, it really didn't. But what it did do is it gave people a tool which they could trust. There was very few instances of aircrew from the B-17s deserting, very few. And if they were, it was normally because they'd fallen in love with, <laughs> with an English rose, what you know, <laughs> down the pub. Um, but they were willing to get back into those aircraft time and again because they could trust it to bring it home, bring them home. And if not, they knew that they would be able to survive, they would be able to escape an aircraft that was heavily damaged nine times out of ten. You know, unless it had a major structural failure or a wing taken off, there was a reasonable chance they'd get out of a B-17 and survive. Well, I, th I think that's that's a very nice summary for it. The, the trust in the aircraft, the trust in it has helped it to have this longevity in it and the, the horror of those daylight raids over occupied yeah. Europe. Yeah. It, it was yeah, another thing. And then when you look at the aircraft, just, just mention ground crew because nothing else without, without the yeah. ground crew, the love, and it was the love that these men and women had for the guys who flew it and the aircraft themselves. Is reflected, you know, the jackets with, with they would they would put the nose art on the back. The ground crew would they would fight for these, you know, old jackets that perhaps weren't gray, A2 grade condition, but so they could they'd paint it on the back of the jackets, or even just their ordinary jackets. They were part of a bigger family, and it was all centered on an aircraft. And the kinship and the fellowship around a single individual piece of machinery, I think very few, some people would find that today very hard mm -hmm. um, to fully understand and, and and, and, and appreciate because it became an extension of them you know the family was the aircraft and the next step mm. takes them well in advance of, <laughs> of where they were when they started with the b-17 so that's the first of boeing's fortresses of course up next is the super fortress which has just a frankly wild tale so for that one 
tune in next week. Thank you, Ben. Thanks so much for having me on, Matt. Really appreciate it. I cannot thank Ben Skipper enough for joining us here on the Damcasters to help us look into the B-17 Flying Fortress. Of course, if you have different views to what we described, stick them in the comments. Let us know. Let's see what the feeling for that very famous aircraft is. And I know Joe Coles over at Hushkit has a very different feeling on the B-17. So let's talk about it. Get involved. And if you want to get involved and get these episodes early, you can see the next two episodes right now on the B-29 and the B-52. You can become a Damcaster over on Patreon for just £3 a month, plus a bit of that on the bottom tier. We get all these things early. We get them to ad-free. And all the help goes to supporting the pod and all the bits and pieces we have around here to keep things going. So head over to patreon.com forward slash the Damcasters to find out more and join the crew of ever-growing aviation fans who we can chat about things and maybe one day get the notifications working <laughs> for the community chat too. So next week, we look at the B-29, the Super Fortress, the aircraft that is synonymous with the dropping of the atomic bombs on Japan in August 1945. But its story is frankly wild. And we had a lot of fun chatting about that one. So until next time, do take care of yourselves. Check out Pima 909. Become a damn kiss dear. Like and subscribe. Thank you for watching. And until next time, do take care of yourselves. Bye. I just want to say many thanks to our fabulous Damn Casteers on Patreon. If you head over to our Patreon page, you can join the crew and get your name in the credits from just £3 a month plus a bit of that. The Damn Casters is hosted and produced by Matt Bowen and is a Boney Abroad podcast production.